Germany is this week celebrating the fall of the Berlin Wall 30 years ago, but the party mood is tinged with dismay. Many in eastern Germany say they've been left behind and feel like second-class citizens. Well, when the wall came down on the 9th of November 1989, the euphoria was boundless. Wahnsinn was the word of the hour. Incredible, people kept saying to each other. A miracle, it seemed, had come to pass, and the wall, which had appeared so immovable, was pierced. But that was then, and now is now. So we ask, 30 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall, what happened to the euphoria? Well, thanks very much for joining us. And with me in the studio today, I have got Linda Fierecker, who grew up in the former GDR and was seven years old when the wall came down. Today, she works as a reporter here at DW and just completed a documentary about the fall of the wall. And Linda says it's only now, three decades after the wall came down, that we realize how radical the change was for people in the East. Also with us is Anglo-French Catherine Nicholson. She's European Affairs Editor with the broadcaster France 24 and believes that permanent euphoria is unrealistic. It's more important to learn lessons from the past, she says. And a warm welcome too to British freelance journalist Tony Patterson, who witnessed the fall of the wall firsthand. He points out that 30 years on from the fall of the wall, the far right is winning a worrying amount of support in the once communist East. Well, thank you once again, all three, for being with me today. I'd like to begin with you, Tony, inevitably, because you were there. What do you remember most? I remember most um, listening or watching television and hearing reports coming in that uh, there was some movement at the crossing points in the Berlin Wall. And so we got into a car and drove flat out to a crossing point at the wall called the Bornholmer Straße. And uh, people were walking towards us as we drove along this wide boulevard and we thought, oh, these must be just West Berliners who have gone to have a look and are now walking back into West Berlin. But as we got closer and closer, more and more people started coming through and it was a, a maelstrom of people by the time we actually managed to walk there and the mood was just incredible. It was... There were people crying, hugging each other. Yeah. Um, you know, when I think about it today, it almost makes me cry. And was... we'd, we'd speculated for so long about this happening and people would always ask themselves, you know, do you think it's going to happen in our lifetime? And then suddenly, Absolutely. my sense is that it came right out of the blue. It is, certainly that, is that how did. you experienced it? Absolutely. Nobody, uh, even who I speak to now, says, oh, it was inevitable that it would happen. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely a shock and a wonderful shock as well. <laughs> <laughs> a wonderful shock. Catherine, you were tucked up in bed. <laughs> I was. I was tucked up in bed. I think I was about eight years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, my, my father had been to Germany just a few weeks before, I think mm -hmm. in September, uh, quite close to, not the Berlin part of the border, but further south. And he'd taken photos and shown us the watchtowers and the soldiers with guns, which is really scary when you're eight mm. years old. So we knew what the Berlin Wall was, my brother and I. And on the night, my mum came upstairs, she got us out of bed, she said, come downstairs, watch this on TV, this mm. is historic. And I don't even really remember her explaining what was going on. We just watched and sort of drank it in and, you know, obviously much harder to get the feeling than if you're actually there like you were. But, you know, uh, you grew up knowing about, knowing about the Berlin Wall mm. and having had that experience of my dad telling us about it. It seemed like you say, what, this huge, scary thing is open? It's, it's gone? What, what is this? And today you are with France 24, and I wonder from the French perspective, when you look back at the, those great days in 1989, how much of a, of a triumph for liberty was it from the French perspective, or was there something scarier going on? Yeah, I think, um, you know, in the, in the moment of the Berlin Wall coming down, I think, as you say in the programme, there was euphoria quite generalised around uh, the, the Western part of Europe and I'm mm. sure behind the Iron Curtain as well. But there was obviously, there was fear in France for many people. I mean, even today, there is a certain ambivalence for a certain part of the population when it comes to the idea of a big, strong Germany. And of course, the idea that the two Germanys might come back together was a worry. So all the more important, perhaps, that it was such a peaceful revolution. Exactly, yeah. I wonder sometimes, actually, when we talk about the problems of reunification, whether we forget somewhat, actually, what an almost miracle it was 
that it was peaceful, you know, this death zone that people were suddenly allowed to come up to. Not mm. a shot fired, nobody killed uh, mm. on that night or the following days as people passed through the wall. Um, and of course, people were suddenly into the, the business of working out what was going on and things. So perhaps that passed everybody by a little bit, but I do think it is worth remembering. It was a peaceful revolution. Absolutely. Let's bring Linda in. Linda, you were born uh, in 1982 in the city of Brandenburg, west of Berlin. How happy was your childhood how, when you look back? Because after all, we do describe, we've just heard about, you know, the forbidding images of Eastern Germany. We, it was a dictatorship. How was it growing up in a dictatorship? I mean, I was really young. And so um, I would say I had a perfectly happy childhood. My grandparents lived in the countryside, so we went there to, you know, what kids do. We climb on trees and, uh, you know, we, we have uh, our friends. And I didn't, ex I didn't, I never felt like I was in a, I was living in a dictatorship. That's not a word that would have appeared at my, me being seven years old. But still, I mean, I remember that night and I remember that for my parents, it was kind of like a liberation, yeah? I mm. mean, they weren't um, uh, suffering much in the GDR, but they still felt unfree. And we had family in, the, uh, in, in, in West Berlin. We had family in uh, Western parts of Germany. So, you know, of course, that was the most happy moment uh, of their lives as well. And like for me, you know, feeling afterwards that it has so much to do with uh, with me. I always, you know, I shiver when you talk about that night because I always think like, oh man, I wish I would have been older. I wish I <laughs> we would have gone there. And my, my mother was a teacher back then and her, we were watching it uh, on TV and she was saying like, okay, how do we, should we go? No, I mean, I have to work tomorrow. I have to go to, you know, the children and, and they didn't go. The you Angela know? Merkel syndrome and Angela Merkel yeah, also came on early because she was working the next day as a scientist. Yeah. Well, as we've already seen, Linda has made a very thought-provoking documentary that's being broadcast here on DW to mark the fall of the wall. It's all about three generations of one family, the, fam the family of Regina Hildebrand, who was a very popular politician in the East, who sadly passed away 18 years ago. Now, let's hear from each of those three generations and then from Linda again. Being walled in, we felt like we'd been imprisoned. But we tried to keep the wall out of our thoughts and tell the children that inner freedom is what counts. You can make anything you want of it and gain from it. In my mind, the West was different. In Berlin, we'd been near the wall many times by the Church of Reconciliation and had peeked over the wall. It looked more colorful and vibrant. When I was 12, I stood in front of the mirror and swore I would not settle for staying. I would get out. Just imagine, this was actually the death strip. And one wall was here and another wall was there. And now we can just walk across, we can dance and make music. How beautiful it is that we're all here and dancing together. Interesting stuff, Linda. The, uh, the grandfather of the three, Jörg, he says, we were walled in, we were imprisoned, uh, but it's the inner freedom that counts. Tell us more. I mean... Uh He's, he and his wife, they actually, they lived in Bernhauer Straße. This is where the wall was, you know, was built. So they really experienced how cruel this, this whole um, uh, divide of Germany was. Really, they saw it with their own eyes. But they decided to stay in the East, which was, you know, people didn't do that. Her, Regine Hildebrand's own brother, he went to the uh, West, uh, you know. So it was really a family that said, okay, we don't want that regime to win us over. You know, so th that was, I think, something that not a lot of people did. And they, of course, they were uh, part of the church back then. So they are, you know, they had their little word, world of freedom where they could also talk among each other. Um, of course, they were also, you know, like um, uh, being watched at, uh, by the Stasi. So, mm -hmm. you know, but it was a family that always, you know, they didn't... Um, they were still heads up, you know, in the system. They still lived their life uh, as they wished to. Interesting. On and what, their niche. what about the granddaughter, Cecilia? We also heard from her. She says that these days, you know, people can and do go and actually dance and party and hang out on the former death strip. How much of a, how typical is that lightness and that optimism for her generation? 
I think it's, you know, this is Berlin, yeah? I mean, you can see in uh, this history every day. I mean, I don't know. I, I cross every day from West to uh, West Berlin to East Berlin, and it's just really normal, and uh, for them as well. Um, I think they're really benefiting from a, a reunited Germany, and this, this generation, I mean, they feel that there's still differences, but also in Berlin, I think a lot of the things are completed. Catherine, Thanks. you're nodding about the younger generation benefiting mm. from, the, the, from the, 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 the economic developments of recent years. But there are, you know, there are many problems out there and there's, some, there's great inequality. Absolutely, yes. I mean, the speed of reunification perhaps was necessary in some senses. If it was going to be done, maybe it did have to be done that quickly, but it was quite a brutal process, wasn't it? With mm. the, the toy hand and the privatisations of all those businesses and all those people made unemployed, was it three million within just a couple of years, I think? And 75 per cent of people yeah. lost their jobs in the in the 90s. It was totally it was just, traumatic. Yeah. yeah, and when you think about, I mean, when there have been periods of mass unemployment in, in France or in the UK, it's never been on that scale uh, and that's left scars for, for such a long time for those generations. And so I think it is yeah. interesting what you say about the new generations mm -hmm. who've only known a unified Germany. I think that they will have a, a you know, they'll be coming at it from a different point of view and some of those scars won't be as present for them, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I think that's very true. I mean, I know uh, people in their 30s who live in Berlin now, Germans, um, and they uh, speak only English among themselves because uh, they've drawn together a whole community of young people of, of their age from Croatia, from all over Europe, and they have English as a common language. And the Berlin Wall is just gone for them. It's it's really is history. Mm. But when we talk about the younger generation, or when we talk about East Germans in general, when we, yes. when we mention the inequalities that you were just yes. describing, how outrageous is it that people are told, East Germans are told constantly and of, yes. over a long period of time now that they are ungrateful <laughs> and they moan too much? You're, 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 you're <laughs> nodding. <laughs> I'm fiercely. nodding, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, if, I, if I talk about the young generation and that the differences are not there so much anymore, I'm talking about Berlin. You know, mm. if you leave That's the, the point, city, isn't it? I think, yeah. uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't say that Germany is united fully because we can see, I mean, we can see the different uh, on, on paychecks, we, we see uh, differences on, you know, where people are represented. So, you, yes, differences are still there. And I think hearing for 30 years that, you know, this isn't that bad, it's what my parents also heard, yeah, you know, you, you just wait and it's everything's going to be what fine. What happened to your parents in the 1990s? Well, my father, like many others, uh, lost his job. Uh, he was working in the steel factory that was gone afterwards. And uh, it, it's, it was just, you know, there was not a lot of jobs you could get into. And uh, it's also, he was the same age like me now, uh, 36, but he never got back on his feet. And mm. this is something, uh, it, was a, it was a brutal change. And I think a lot of people around, uh, all my friends have different stories to tell. So, you know, and just realizing how brutal and how, you know, not only losing a job, but also the values that are in the system, you know, that mm. changed. Everything changed, you know. People went to the West, uh, uh, the social millions networks. Millions of people went to the West. Millions of people. So your social network also was gone, in mm. a way. So I think we're just only beginning now to really fully understand it and also um, kind of, like, understand the people because, really, something that you always heard was, yeah, come on, it's, it's only about... It's only about money. No, it's not only about money. It's about learning a whole new system in a really, really short amount of time. And I think that was a lot, too much for And I people. think something that's interesting that we spoke about before the programme was about how, for people in West Germany, their life didn't really change. Mm. Uh, you know, there was this sense that perhaps they were paying for the East and, and all of that. But in terms of day-to-day -day life, things weren't changing in the same way they were for the East Germans with this, as you say, an entirely different system of, uh, well, democracy, uh, capitalism, a completely different way of thinking about yourself in the world. Mm. I, think, I think that's the case. I mean, I think um, that it was really, with hindsight, a complete Western takeover of the East and uh, West Westerners still occupy major... Could that have been yeah. avoided? Should that have been avoided, this takeover as you describe it? Well, I think um, if you have a situation which you had in 1989 that uh, the majority of East Germans were screaming for the Deutschmark, mm -hmm. uh, they wanted 
reunification really badly. And but they about three money. weeks earlier, they were screaming for democratic socialism. Yes, but it... That it Something happened. <laughs> it snowballed very, very quickly, and people realised, I think, as soon as they went over and got their so-called greeting money, they got, mm. I think, 100 uh, Deutschmarks each, and they soon realised that that wasn't going to get them anywhere. So um, they wanted uh, reunification very, very quickly, and the logical consequence of it was that it would be a Western takeover because they had the the cash to do it. Well, and they had the numbers as well, the, the numbers, population yes. difference as yes. well. I think it, we looked at it a lot back then market-wise, which I understand in the context, and it was also nobody knew how mm. long we would have to really reunify uh, There was Germany. no alternative logic. That was the problem to the market logic. Mm. It yes. appeared. But, you know, I mean, uh, I think I agree with the takeover because, you yeah. know, what would have been nice, looking back 30 years, is looking at uh, what are things that we might could take over from one system to the other to help us all together to bring, you know, bring our Germany forward. And I think they never did that. I mean, there was, uh, uh, you know, there, there's also, it's, it's about solidarity. And I think we lost that in, in a way, looking at it from a market point of view only. Mm -hmm. Well, internationally, Angela Merkel has been far and away the most visible former East German. At home, it's a different story, though. The question is, why? From the outside, Angela Merkel's rise as the first Eastern German woman to become chancellor of a reunified Germany sounds like a success story. American business magazine Forbes named her the world's most powerful woman seven years in a row. U.S. President Obama honored Angela Merkel with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, America's highest civilian award, partly because of her efforts for freedom in East Germany. After the unpredictable Donald Trump took office, many turned to Merkel to be the leader of the free world. But in Germany, Chancellor Merkel often encounters hostility bordering on hatred when she appears, especially in the East. Hecklers yell, beat it. Many reject her refugee policies and chant, we are the people. Protesters feel angry and disappointed with the woman from the East. Many of them feel that she doesn't represent their interests. Merkel is being worn down by political bickering at home. Has Chancellor Merkel only divided Germany? Well, that's an interesting question, but the one I would really like to ask Linda is, why is Angela Merkel such a red rag for so many people in Eastern Germany? Difficult question, but I think one thing is, you know, she never did like really her, her East German identity never came through really. And so, you know, people don't see her as an East German politician, but mm -hmm. as a politician, you know, working for the system as they call it, or she's one of the others and she's playing it really well and she's really successful within the system. But I think uh, m many of the East Germans or especially the ones voting for rather uh, wide wing populist parties like the uh, AFD, mm -hmm. you know, they, they don't identify with her and her politics. So um, this is why. This is my explanation. Yeah. Tony, I know you're very interested in the rise of the populist right in Europe. I wonder whether you've identified a special Eastern German angle on that narrative. Well, I think it's uh, very much this feeling that uh, people uh, in the East feel that they left behind. It goes back, plays back into this whole thing of a Western takeover, which mm. it was, and I think people are beginning to realise that it was that now. And uh, a lot of people don't feel represented. They feel that there's an elite up there. It's like Brexit in Britain. Mm. There's an elite up there which uh, uh, tells them all what to do, and they're not. Uh, the elite is not telling them what they want to hear. Mm. They don't want to be told that they've got refugees coming to live next door to them. Um, and they say, who asked us? And it, it all comes together. If you have a, a right-wing political party that can uh, pull in all these arguments and uh, vocalise them, then you've got something like the AFD, and that's why it's making su such big inroads. I can sense Catherine wanted to get in on the, 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 the marginalised left behind. Absolutely, and I think there are parallels in so many parts of the Western world, mm. for want of a better word. You know, in France, the Gilets Jaunes movement uh, really struck me what you said about young people in cities in Germany feel like unification's happened. Well, similarly, in Paris, there isn't a big local Gilets Jaunes movement, even if that's where a lot of demonstrations happen. Mm. It's people who live in the countryside who are having fewer and fewer uh, GPs and shops, and even, you know, the bakeries are closing down, which is really symbolic and important in mm. France. You know, it means that there isn't life in those places anymore. They feel like Emmanuel feeling. Macron is like a king in Paris, sort of directing without knowing about their lives. So I feel like here in Germany, that's a different iteration of 
quite a similar phenomenon. Well, what to do here in Germany? About the 57% of Eastern German people, people in Eastern Germany who say they feel like second-class citizens. I mean, it's not just another poll, this is 57%. I think people's lives do need to be paid attention to. So your sense of self, your sense of pride, your sense of purpose. Why has Angela important. Merkel, sorry to interrupt you, but that's the pressing question. Why has Angela Merkel not addressed them? Why has she not established that dialogue? Perhaps it's easier to not to address it <laughs> in some senses when you've got a country that's economically stable and prosperous. Although I think perhaps the downturn that's being forecast as coming in it the next couple of testing. years, it could be a massive test. Yeah. Mm. I think it's a, it's a, there's a lot of things you can do. I mean, if there if there's differences, you can see on the paycheck. Uh, Thirty years after uh, the, the wall came down, we have to uh, equal uh, equal it. But that's then one people thing. people in the West will say that's so unfair because the cost of living in the East, the rents and what but have you, is so much cheaper. It. it doesn't make up to it. And, and and I always say, you know, the narrative we're we're saying is, you know, uh, you people in the East, you you didn't uh, pay uh, the, the same amount of money that the Western people did. It's not true. I mean, somebody decided to draw a line, yeah, to, mm -hmm. to, to build a wall, but it wasn't the people in the East. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you start the uh, story, to tell the story from there, you know, you, you, you get, um, you, uh, you distance yourself a little bit from the, whose fault it is that the people were there, uh, there. And I think 30 years after the wall, why does my mother, who was a teacher for 43 years, why yeah. does she have to earn less than a teacher in the West? I don't get it. Mm. How angry do you get about these things? I, do, I get really angry. And I, <laughs> you know, and not 53% of, um, um, of the population uh, are really unsatisfied. And, you know, not all of them vote for the AFD. But, you know, I think it is a problem if they're not represented. That's, for me, that's the most mm. pressing is mm. issue. If you don't, if you're not, and, and that's figures, 1.7% of the East Germans are in leading position, top positions only. Mm. Only 1.7% of them are East Germans, yeah? Mm -hmm. So if you're I not represented... I read the shocking fact the other day that... A Eastern German universities and colleges of higher education, I don't know how many there are, several dozen at least, all of the heads of all of these institutions in the East yeah. are from the, uh, from the West. From the West. Yes. So, yeah, this is something you have to change. Mm. Mm. And there you are, you know, if you don't feel... I, well, I think part of the if system. you look at, uh, look at it in, in, uh, across the board, I mean, East Germany has profited enormously since the fall of the Berlin Definitely. Wall. And uh, people are a lot richer and uh, joblessness has fallen completely. But... I think now we've got to the stage where people are beginning to realise really what happened and are looking back properly at history and saying, well, what really happened to East Germany and what are these people's concerns? But it's taken a really long time for that to happen. Mm. And I think that young generation that you were talking about is mm. probably a really big part of the key, part of the solution to this, because, you know, people who do not have that mental wall that people born before the fall of the wall talk about. You know, they, they've grown up with unified Germany. So I suppose if, if that generation can feel a, a, a desire to stay in East Germany, to start businesses there, to start their families there, because there's been the big bra brain drain as well and population transfer. You mm. know, if, if a new generation of East Germans can feel East German and feel hopeful about East Germany. Statistics play into that. I mean, mm. there are more people going back to East Germany now than there are leaving. Mm. So it, that's the for tide the first time. But so many yeah. have gone already. I think there's a small percentage yes. for, for them. That's true. But if we look at the numbers and in, in, yeah. in the last elections uh, in Thuringia, it was actually people uh, uh, younger than 30 that also voted for a large percentage for the AfD. So How I do you think you know that? our viewers want to know why. <laughs> <laughs> such Tough a, questions. Uh, AFD is, uh, it's problematic. I mean, I think it has a lot to do with, like, cities and, uh, and like, really uh, areas where there's not much uh, structure, there's not much jobs, high-paying jobs. You feel left out. I think that's really a, a big... Sense of uh, purpose. Yeah, because also in the East we have great cities, yeah, that are functioning, that are, don't vote for the AFD that much. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's, that's a big part of the problem. And it's also uh, what I said about representation. If, you know, part of the system, you know, you, you, you don't... You don't vote for the system and the AFD claims to be an anti-establishment party and that's where they come in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tony, we began with you. Yes. Yeah. What happened to the euphoria? What became of the euphoria? Well, I think um, euphor euphoria has sort of given way to reality and I think uh, that what happened is that people have uh, realised how much they've actually sort of lost out and uh, now have to really uh, re-establish their own identities. Not only in East Germany, you look at countries like Poland, mm -hmm. like Good Hungary, point. Good point. Yeah. where um, people thought, oh, it's the end of history in 1989, everybody's going to be a, a nice liberal. They're not. I mean, people are trying to 
find out who they really are through right-wing movements. But that will change. Things are changing. In Hungary, I think, last month, uh, Orban's party uh, lost in Budapest. Budapest is no longer mm -hmm. controlled by Orban's party. So it's moving in the opposite direction, and Brexit has not been decided <laughs> yet. <laughs> Catherine, how long is it going to take for East and West to grow together? It's a good question, isn't it? Um, well, I think that, well, this issue of euphoria, where's it gone? It only gets you so far. It's a constant process, isn't it? History's happening all the time. So, you know, perhaps the end point people foresaw in 1989 will never happen, but Germany's going to get somewhere else. OK, Linda, have you got a one-sentence message of optimism? Yes, I'm pretty optimistic. I think there's... Uh, it will take maybe a little more, but... Uh, Two or three generations. She's very optimistic? angry, but she said it with a lovely, <laughs> with a lovely smile. Thanks very much for joining us here on To the Point. If you've enjoyed the show as much as I have, do come back next week. Until then, just bye bye. <laughs>